Hi, everyone, and good evening. My name is Ali Gustafson, your community organizer with KS Wild. And I'm calling in from the unceded ancestral lands of the native tribes of the Takilma people that is now called Grants Pass, Oregon. And it is mighty, mighty hot right now. The native peoples of this land are not only important parts of the history of this place, but in its future and the continuing knowledge of this place. So if you don't know whose land you're on right now, go find out. Educate yourself with the place you live and with the work those tribal nations are advocating for. Other ways you can support tribal peoples is to make a donation to your local tribal nation. If you don't know where to start, a good place is to check out our indigenous resource page on the KS Wild website. I'll make sure to put that link in the chat box. And since I can't see any of your faces, it's fun to see where everyone is calling in from tonight. So navigate your way to the chat box and let us know where you're zooming in from. It's so great to have you all here tonight. Thank you for finding your way here. We have a great presentation in store for you titled Bridging the Gaps Between Traditional Ecological Knowledge and Contemporary Science, brought to you by the Native Fish Society and KS Wild. Before we begin, I do have a few announcements. The Love Where You Live webinar series is produced by KS Wild. We are an environmental nonprofit working to protect and restore wild nature in the Klamath Siskiyou region. We promote science-based land and water conservation through policy and through community action, which is all of you. So thank you for being with us tonight and for your support to protect the Klamath Siskiyou region. With me here tonight is Kirk Blaine with the Native Fish Society and um, our guest speaker, uh, Keith Parker, who he will introduce in just a moment. So I'll turn it over to you, Kirk. Thanks for uh, co-sponsoring this event with us tonight. Yeah, thank you, Ali, for having us. So, um, and thank you for the wonderful introduction. Uh, my name is Kirk Blaine. I'm the Southern Oregon Regional Coordinator for Native Fish Society. I started with Native Fish Society a little over a year ago um, and am loving my position here in Southern Oregon. I wanted to share a little bit about our organization with you before we get started tonight. Native Fish Society was founded in 1995 by a small group of passionate anglers and advocates. Since then, we've grown into one of the leading grassroots nonprofit native fish conservation organizations in the Northwest. We serve nearly 4,000 members and supporters, and 80% of our funding comes from individuals. We are a grassroots led and grassroots funded organization. Our mission is to restore and protect abundant runs of wild native fish and to steward the rivers and watersheds that sustain us all. Our work is grounded in the best available science and ecological knowledge. Our ultimate vision is wild fish for all. Our organization focuses on multiple programs throughout the Pacific Northwest, including our river steward program and fellowship program. Today, Native Fish Society supports 88 river stewards safeguarding watersheds in Northern California, Oregon, Idaho, and Washington. Our advocacy surrounds what we like to call the five H's, habitat, hatcheries, hydropower, harvest, and heat. To learn more about our organization, please feel free to contact me. I will share my information in the chat box and via the, an email following tonight's presentation. I want to extend a wonderful thank you to our friends and partners at KS Wild for hosting this presentation tonight. Their support with our work and the advocacy for wild places continues to drive conservation throughout Southern Oregon and Northern California. With that, I wanna let everyone know that this session will be recorded and we, all have, we have saved time at the end for question and answers. So please type your questions and answers into the chat box. Now, get comfy, sit back with your favorite beverage, and I hope you enjoy tonight's presentation. And now, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Keith Parker, 
Yurok Tribe Senior Fisheries Biologist. Keith received a Bachelor's of Science degree in Fisheries Biology in 2015 from Humboldt State University and a Master's of Science degree in Natural Resources from Humboldt State University in 2018 with a thesis on conservation genetics. He examined the spatial temporal genetic structure of Klamath River Pacific lamprey using high throughput genetic sequencing and discovered two new ecotype of eels, naming them using words from the Yurok language. His goal is to be a catalyst for positive environmental change by being a translator and bridging the gaps between traditional ecological knowledge and modern science. Thank you for being with us tonight. And now I'll turn it over to you, Keith, to begin your presentation. Great. There you go. There I am. Awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Forget it. I almost had a zoom meltdown. Okay. Oh. <laughs> well, thanks for having me here tonight, you guys. I, I truly do appreciate it. I, uh, any outreach that we can do to help, you know, benefit uh, the ecosystem of the Klamath River Basin, I'm all in. Um, and as uh, uh, Kurt mentioned, uh, I am a senior biologist for the Yurok Tribe in Northern California. And we're the largest tribe by population in California. And I think we're the second largest by area behind the Hoopa tribe. Uh, I'm an enrolled Yurok tribal member, uh, as well as a biologist for the tribe. I'm also Hoopa, Kuduruk, and Tolawa. Um, so I think I only have about 30 minutes to speak. So uh, I think I'll just kind of jump into it. So the layout is I'm just going to share my screen with you. Uh, I think there's people that may have called in. I'm not sure. I apologize for that. You know, not everyone's going to be able to see the slides if you called in, obviously. Um, and then at the end, if you have any questions, maybe just hold off your questions to the end and you can put them in the chat room or, you know, ask them verbally. There'll be a time for question and answer at the end. And um, I'm just going to run through this, you know, fairly rapidly. Uh, there's, there's a lot of information to try to get out in a short, short amount of time. But hopefully um, when you leave here, you'll walk away with a little bit more knowledge about other fish in the Klamath River system um, besides salmon. Um, as you know, um, salmon are extremely important to my people. We're salmon-centric people, but we're also just as important are Pacific lamprey, sturgeon, eulicon, steelhead, you know, all the, not only the anadromous fish species, but the resident fish species as well. And so with that, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so hopefully, there we go. You guys see that okay? We see it. Thank okay, you. so that's the mouth of the Klamath River. Many, some of you are very familiar with the, the mouth of the Klamath. It changes periodically over time, depending on the season. Uh, it closes up typically in the fall uh, during low flows, and then it'll break open a new mouth. I just wanted to mention also, the uh, Native Fish Society is an incredible organization, as well as the Klamath Tishku, um Wilderness uh, Organization. And so is the National Science Foundation to the federal government um, and the Switzer Foundation. Both of those uh, organizations sponsored me through my graduate work. And all of the findings that I had that benefited the Klamath River would not be possible if it wasn't for the National Science Foundation and the Switzer Fellowship. Uh, those fellowships allowed me to go through grad school without having to work and really focus on the genetic analysis uh, that uh, provided for me to discover those two new subspecies. So here's a little bit broader view picture of the Klamath River. Some of you may be familiar with it, some not. Um, this is the end of a roughly 300 mile river that starts in Oregon and flows all the way down through Southern Oregon and Northern California into the Pacific Ocean. Um, and, so as you can see here, the mouth was way north when this picture was taken, which was like five years ago. The previous picture, the mouth was right about here. And right now, currently, it's way south. It goes down almost down to this rock over here. So the mouth changes constantly. This estuary is in flux. And then this September, October, late fall, it will seal up again when the flows get low. And then it'll find a weak spot and break through again. 
<clears throat> Just to give you a quick overview, if you're not familiar, um, again, he, here's the mouth of the Klamath right here, flows up this way. The Trinity River comes in here at Witchpeck, flows along up over the Oregon border. And then these are the four dams that are slated for removal. Uh, Iron Gate Dam is the first one. And then you have Copco one and two, and then the Boyle Dam on the Oregon side. So it, it drains a very large area. Um, if you can see over here that the Williamson, the Wood and the Sprague Rivers um, are way, way up here, almost to Crater Lake. Um, so again, third largest salmon return river on the West Coast behind the Columbia and the Sacramento system. And here's just a more close up view of Klamath Falls, Upper Klamath Lake. And so here's the Keno Dam and the same dams. <clears throat> so I wanna to talk to you a little bit uh, about what I did as a graduate student and then as a segue way into, into where I'm at now. So as a, as a graduate student at Humboldt State, um, you know, like I said, I conducted my research on these tribal trust fish species, Pacific lamprey. Um, and one of the reasons I did that is because A, it's an understudied fish. Um, B, it's extremely important to Native American tribes of the West Coast. And it also is a tribal trust fish species. Um, and so my work really merges the paradigms of like traditional ecological knowledge with modern science. And so as a Native scientist, I push back against the false narrative that science is not related to social justice. Because for us, fish recovery is simultaneously a social justice issue and it's a scientific issue. They can't be separated. Um, because from a TEK perspective, traditional ecological knowledge perspective, species loss not only represents a loss of biodiversity, but it's a loss of our cultural heritage as well. So these are some examples of, you know, the different fish species that are important to Native American tribes of the Klamath River Basin. I think I touched on them earlier. These are all pictures of fish that I harvest and like smokehouse fish hanging here, salmon harvesting in the fall and then sturgeon. Um, so for me, you know, as a native scientist, increasing the abundance of Klamath River fish, um, you know, it's my calling because for our people, the river is our grocery store. In fact, our closest grocery store in Klamath is 25 miles away on the other side of a, of a highway slide, right? Our people have been provided um, our food from this basin for tens of thousands of years since time immemorial. So that's why, you know, it's, it's literally my calling. You know, I've had jobs before. I even had a couple of careers. But late in life, when I became a fisheries biologist, and went back to school knowing that I needed to have huge impact um, on, on my home river because it, it was dying, right? The fish kill of, of O2 and other fish kills that have occurred. So it, it really is a calling, which is you know, way different than a job or career. <clears throat> so, you know, the massive destruction of the Klamath, you know, ecosystem, it's really significantly impacted tribal food security and our food sovereignty. And um, someone smarter than me, it was I think Valerie Segrest of the Muckleshoot tribe, said that the right of a community to define its own diet and therefore shape its own food system with access to all historical traditional food is food sovereignty. And I want to say that, you know, at the core of tribal sovereignty is food sovereignty. Because food is a foundational part of our culture, right? And that's because these traditional foods, like you see on the screen, they feed much more than our bodies. They feed our spirits. And that's because for us, these foods represent our living link with the land and with the river. And, you know, you've heard the saying, you know, you are truly what you eat. And so are we. And, and we eat the earth. And, um... So it's really important for that paradigm to really try to sink in um, that, you know, it's not just science for us. This is our culture. Our people have been consuming and eating and living off the river for tens of thousands of years, such as like 
you know, surfish and sturgeon and sturgeon eggs and some of the other things that I showed here. <clears throat> so one of the really important uh, species to us, of course, is Pacific lamprey. Um, and one of the reasons is, is that eels, that's what we call them, have two to three times the lipid content of a salmon. So a salmon, depending on species, has like 1.4 to 1.9 kilocalories per gram of body weight. Pacific lamprey has six kilocalories per gram of body weight, right? So it provided this high caloric food during the cold winter months when salmon weren't running because the, run, uh, the runs of Pacific lamprey enter around December. So about the time that the last salmon are running, the coho, which come in last, like through November, when they're done, the Pacific lamprey show up in like December, January, and they run strong through the whole winter until the spring salmon show up and then they start waning off. So we feel that it's, it's not by default, but it's by design that these highly lipid fish came into the river and provided our people with this, with this diet during the times when salmon were unavailable and when human beings needed to pack on lots of body weight it's the coldest time of the year, you know, to stay warm. Uh, and, and so it was, it's, it's a really important fish to us for during the winter. Um, so let's talk a little bit about why they're important first about ecologically, okay? So I put them all up on the screen at once and let's just run through them. It's actually quite interesting. A lot of people don't realize this about Pacific lamprey, that the Klamath River Basin actually supports the highest number of lamprey species in the world. I believe it's up to six now. And we have some that are only found here, nowhere else in the world, like the Miller Lake um, lamprey and the Klamath similis. Mm -hmm. And historically, the largest biomass of anything living in the Klamath River is, is thought to be Pacific lamprey. They would come back you know, by the millions historically. In fact, so many would return that our people have stories that when the lamprey would return and spawn and then they would die, they die like a salmon, they're a one-time spawner. Um, when uh, that happened, when their bodies started breaking down, a film would form on the river and a smell, um, you know, so intense that people would leave the river for days on end or a week until that that uh, stench and that and that coloration and the foam would 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 flow down river. Um, so people think you know oh salmon are the largest, but actually pretty well thought to be that Pacific lamprey were. Pacific lamprey also serve as a buffer species to migrating salmon. So it's one more like piece in the pie of salmon uh, protection and rehabilitation and restoration. Um, uh, marine mammals at the mouth of rivers, they prefer to eat Pacific lamprey because Pacific lamprey are scaleless, they're slimy, they're really slow, uh, unguliform swimmers. They enter the mouth in groups so the sea lions can come in behind them and they swallow them whole because again, no scales. And uh, it doesn't take a lot of energy to capture one. And remember what I said earlier, they actually get more bang for their buck. There's more lipid content in there than a salmon. And really, when you look at like um, salmon predation by marine mammals, you know, eight, nine times out of 10, they actually don't even get the salmon and they spend a lot of energy chasing it. And then even when they catch it, they spend a lot of energy eating it. We've all seen them, right? Shake the salmon around, tearing off pieces of meat. Much of it goes to waste to birds and then other sea lions get in there. Um, but as we've seen with declines of Pacific lamprey at the, at, at the rivers over time, um, we've seen marine mammals turn more to predating on salmon. Um, so again, one more piece of the puzzle in salmon restoration is let's restore our, our Pacific lamprey run so that it takes some of the predation pressure off of, uh, of salmon entering the river. Um, and then as I touched earlier, significantly higher lipid content, we talked about that. Um, and then the spawned out lamprey, the, the essential biomass of their marine derived nutrients, right, to the food web of these headwater streams, you know, that is, it's not even measurable, like what we've lost there, like from dam building and from population reduction. I mean, the most advantageous nutrients on the planet are marine derived micronutrients, right? We know that. The reason that all these anadromous fish that are born in freshwater take the risk to travel to the marine environment 
to live out in the majority of their life history is because the ocean has all the good stuff to eat, right? All the highly lipid stuff like, you know, squid, herring, anchovies, right? And um, so they sit out in the ocean uh, and parasitize on other fish, um, these lamprey do with that sucking disc, and they're absorbing, you know, all of these uh, marine derived nutrients in their body, right? So then when they return to the river um, and swim up river and spawn and die, and their carcasses begin breaking down, many of them are drug out into the forest floor, right? There's like dozens of creatures that eat Pacific lamprey, right? Like not just birds like blue heron, but there's mink and fishers and hawks, eagles, osprey, bear, right? All kinds of them. And they drag them out into the forest floor and they don't consume at all. And they're messy eaters. And they oftentimes will just take the entrails out or maybe the head. So the remainder of that body is absorbed into those ecosystems, right? And Basically, it's fish fertilizer. And it, I think it was like 30 years ago when they were doing core samples of redwoods, they started finding, you know, marine derived phosphorus, you know, many miles inland. And they were trying to figure out where's this marine derived phosphorus coming from? And they realized that it's in the bodies of these anadromous fish like lamprey and salmon, you know, that spawn and die, right? And so when all of these is absorbed into these headwater streams, that causes the riparian plant growth, the plants on the edge of the headwater streams to really flourish, right? And grow out over these streams where, where all of these fish are returning to spawn. And uh, all those leaves create shade, right? Over these streams, which lowers the temperature of the water, which helps the emerging fish later on in the spring. And when you have all of those leaves, what else happens? We have all kinds of terrestrial insects, right? That make their home on those leaves. And then a lot of them fall in the water and that creates fish food. And all those riparian plants, they have roots that go into the stream bank and that creates bank stability and reduces erosion so that, you know, dirt and, and things are not eroding into the spawning beds of like salmonids and stuff, right? And if you have more plants, what else do you have? You have more deer, right? There's more plants to eat. If you can support more deer, you can support more mountain lion, right? Because they consume deer. So there's this ripple effect. And really that's why these anadromous fish like, you know, lamprey and salmon, sturgeon are, are truly keystone species um, ecologically and, and culturally, because there's really nothing that could replace them without them. There's a lot of different things in this ecosystem that are dependent upon these fish that uh, nothing else could fill that niche. They're also an indicator species of ecosystem health. Just real quick life history lesson on them. They live in the river four to seven years in a larval stage. They don't have any eyeballs. They don't have that sucking disc and they actually don't even have kidneys. Um, and then for whatever reason, we don't know the exact mechanism what triggers it, but from between years four and seven, they go through a metamorphosis and they grow uh, eyeballs where there were eye spots before and they they go from filter feeding and they develop that that sucking disc that we all know uh and infamous <laughs> know or love or hate uh and then the carrot the super oral keratin um teeth basically and the rasping tongue and then they also grow kidneys we believe so that it allows them to go out into salt water um, and become urohaline because you can't handle uh, getting rid of salt if you don't have kidneys. Um, so during that time, they're absorbing all of the stuff that's in the river and the sediment. So they're really good indicators of ecosystem health for, for a river. Um, and the other cool thing about them is during that time, you know, that those that seven years or five years, or how long they live in that larval stage, they're like little engineers. In fact, there's a Japanese paper out by a Japanese scientist put a paper out and basically was calculating that, you know, they literally in their lifetime will move tons of sediment on the bottom of the river. And they do that. And that um, creates oxygenation of that sediment. It gets out all the toxins off the river sediment and gets it suspended into the, into the uh, water stream. It also, you know, creates food for the fish that sit around and will eat all of that. And here's a little short video to give you an idea of what I mean. So here's a group of larval lamprey. These, some of these are as small as, you know, two inches long. Maybe the longest one here is, 
is, is a few inches. But it gives you a rough idea. So they're doing this constantly and burrowing down and burrowing around and popping up and filter feeding. Um, and you can imagine if there were millions of these in a system, the amount of sediment that, that they could move. It's, it's pretty amazing. So that, that was the um, you know, ecological analysis. So let's talk about culturally why they're important. Uh, the picture on the far left is a distant relative of mine, like my great, great uncle. This picture was taken in the 1920s down in Requa at the mouth of the Klamath River. And as you can see behind him there, there's probably a thousand lamprey, right? And they would collect these in eel baskets and use eel hooks. And then over the next few days, he's probably smoking all of those and putting them away for the winter. There's a sturgeon hanging next to him. And then on the right, Here's a picture I took of myself. This is a traditional eel hook that we use to capture them. And then we flatten them out and we smoke them. And they'll last for months if you completely smoke all the oil out of them. So um, I wanna talk, just jump in this a little bit before we run out of time about traditional ecological knowledge. A lot of people I think don't fully understand, you know, exactly what is TEK, right? And so, it's kind of a brief explanation of like how I view it. So, you know, we can view the natural world as like something to exploit, right? As we've seen in modern times, right? Since the industrial revolution, right? With dams, mining, logging, fracking, over harvest of fish, or 180 degrees, we can see it as something to protect, right? Let's throw it in a national park. Let's make it a wilderness area. Let's make a per marine protected area out in the ocean. But in both of those cases, humans are considered separate from nature, right? So whether you exploit it or you protect it, you're in essence saying that, you know, you're, you're either have dominion over nature or you're separating yourself from nature. Whereas traditional ecological practices is different. We view it as we're singular, right? So that humanity is completely intertwined with nature, right? The animals, the, the resources, right? They're our brothers and our sisters. So they, examples would be like food sources and food extraction, um, you know, our language, our ceremony, our culture, it all evolves synchronously through our interactions with our world, not independently. And that's a key thing to understand. And it's not just our culture, any indigenous um, group you look at throughout the world over time, if you remove any one of those things from the equation, if you take away, you know, their food products that, they're, that they've uh, uh, adapted to or their language, right, or their religion, it's going to have deleterious effects on all of the other things. They're all dependent upon each other. Food is, uh, as I said earlier, is like at the core of sovereignty, really. So TEK is also like how people do things. It's like how you fish with a dip net, how you batter gas, mat, uh, basket materials, right? Cultural burning. And remember too, traditional doesn't mean it's not adaptive or modern. It, traditional ecological knowledge can evolve also, and it has evolved. You know, um, look at someone like me as a tribal member, tribal scientist with a graduate degree in fisheries doing high throughput genetic work, right? But uh, use it, I use an eel hook that's been used for tens of thousands of years to catch all of my samples at the mouth of the river with, with a simple eel hook, you know? So we're evolving too, and, and our practices are evolving as well. Um, and just to talk briefly about that interaction with human beings, these, these, um, these relationships that we have with nature, you know, are all around us. An example would be, you know, like what we exhale carbon dioxide the redwood trees outside my house here, they breathe. And what the redwood tree exhales, oxygen, is what human beings breathe, right? And we know how much incredible sequestering ability that a coast redwood has, right? It can sequester like the equivalent of like 250, you know, regular trees, right? And then the downside of that, of course, is that when we cut them down or burn them, all of that, you know, 250 times CO2 absorption is then released into the atmosphere, further warming the environment. And just some other examples about how like the TEA, the TEK view of just, 
you know, how integrated human beings are with nature. You know, we don't view it as having dominion over nature. We are completely integrated and meshed with nature. And if you look at like the tree of life and a human placenta, you know, if you look at a salmon scale, <laughs> something I look at thousands a year, I, I age about five to 7,000 salmon a year in my work. Um, and that's an example of one of mine that I took a picture. And then you look at a tree stump rings, you look at fingerprints, you can see these commonalities between, you know, human beings and nature. You look at the branches of your lungs, you compare that to a tree branch. You look at the veins of a leaf, human veins, a river network. So there's examples all around us. These are just some easy examples. You know, some are more simple, some are more complex, but there are examples all over about, you know, our uh, synchronization, you know, with nature as human beings. And so, you know, as a tribal scientist on a daily basis, this is kind of the area that I have to work in. I have to wear hats all the time and change them constantly, depending on my audience, depending on, you know, a lot of different factors. So if you took three circles, one of them being like my traditional ecological knowledge, right, from growing up on the Klamath River and all the things that my grandfather taught me how to do and all my cultural practices, and that being done over and over and over again for thousands of years has allowed uh, different tribes, wherever they're located, to, to develop this place-based identity, right? And then if you take the Western science, you know, the modern STEM, and that was your third circle, where those three circles overlap, that's where someone like me, a scientist, literally lives every single day. Uh, you know, and, and, and um, I might be in a meeting with um, National Marine Fisheries and, and NOAA Fisheries and California Fish and Wildlife. And I might get off that meeting and 10 minutes later be in a meeting with my tribal council comprised of elders, right? That don't have degrees in fisheries or genetics. And I have to be able to translate what was just talked about in that meeting to my council. And then maybe the next day I translate what my council said back to, to those federal and state agencies. Right. Um, so I think it's just really important to understand that um, a lot of scientists that are working for the tribes, you know, um, everywhere um, have to constantly be changing their paradigms and how they're viewing things, depending on what they're doing. And I really think that's what makes us very effective scientists is because we have this ability to adapt and to have these different viewpoints. And we bring to the table these different viewpoints, right? And I think that's really powerful um, that, that we bring to these meetings, this, this other, this, these other paradigms um, regarding you know, nature and um, traditional ecological knowledge and um, what our people have been doing uh, for thousands of years to develop this place-based identity. I'm not sure how much time I have. I, I'm, how much time do I have left, uh, Ali? I'm at 6.33, I see. Keith, you're doing good on time. Uh, we have um, until 6.45, so you're good. Oh, oh okay. You think I had extra slides now? <laughs> um, but, you know, I also want to say that, you know, salmon, sturgeon, Pacific lamprey, and these other fish that we've been talking about, you know, they've been keystone cultural species for thousands of years, right? Since before the last ice age, we know for sure. And I just want to say that, you know, that relationship, um, it exemplifies the Klamath River Basin's tribe's abilities to maintain a sustainable fishery. And I think it really illustrates the depth of knowledge that tribes possess regarding fish management. You know, it was only up until recently um, that we've seen these crashes, right, of, of fish populations since the Industrial Revolution started. Um, so, you know, the, the dam construction it was a big part of that. And, you know, it's prevented fish passage. It's cut off hundreds of miles of spawning and rearing habitat. And that's because these, the dams, they close the river energy circuit, right? So it blocks that dynamic connectivity between river energy output and input, right? So the, the potential energy output contained in river flow is stopped at that dam 
that energy is used, it drops the water 100 feet to turn a turbine, right? And it, the important thing there is it's interrupted the nutrient spiraling and recycling processes. And equally important is interrupted the sediment transport. We know now that sediment moving down a river is extremely important, right? It's like a, a sandblaster. It erodes much of the algae that grows on rocks and, and keeps a clean river down below, right? And then as far as going the other direction, you know, that potential energy input to the headwater streams, like I talked about earlier, is contained in the carcasses of all those returning anadromous fish which spawn and die. And that's all been blocked. So, you know, those natural nutrient fluxes have been eliminated. Um, you know, and so be, because of the dam building, you know, frankly, like the place-based identities of tribal peoples cannot coexist with like unprecedented damming and logging and mining and overfishing. <laughs> so, um, you know, and then other factors are fish hatcheries, um, which were built to mitigate the dam building. Obviously there's no hatcheries for Pacific lamprey, but for salmon, which is, you know, impacted our um, salmon populations. So let's just jump in really quick about some of the work that I do and how some of the species discoveries that I made. Um, so this is where I work on a daily basis at the mouth of the Klamath River. That's actually my personal boat. It's not a work boat, but every day during grad school, I would go down and get samples. And that, that was the boat I used uh, to go down to the river. And then, um, so Pacific lamprey, if you're not familiar with them or seen them down at the mouth of the river, there's one there. And so on an outgoing tide, when the tide is really fast, they tend to move way to the edge because again, they're not modern fish. They're not modern teleos. They don't have large fins like a salmon, right? Um, they're more like a snake. They, it's called anguliform swimming, but they, they swim like a snake. And so they can't handle really swift currents. Um, so they stay to the edge, which makes capture of them um, fairly easy. <clears throat> and so the, the hook that you see in the sand there is a traditional Yurok eel hook that, that, the, that we make, that men make with a wooden handle. And we use um, um, a piece of metal that we form and sharpen so that we can spear them upon entry. And then we typically dig a hole at the river mouth like that. Um, and then there's a, actually a nicer hook. That one's got abalone inlay. But a lot of different men um, will make the, the, the eel handles you know, based on their family history, or maybe it'll tell a story, but it's, you'll likely not see any two eel hooks alike. So that was the pretty incredible thing about this project was is that uh, I was able to you know, capture about 248 of these adult Pacific lamprey returning from the ocean on their spawning migration using traditional methods and traditional knowledge, knowing where to fish, when to fish, right? How to fish. Uh, and then I was able to genotype them using, you know, high throughput genetic analysis at, at a lab up in Idaho. So it was a pretty cool project of being able to combine, you know, the old and the new to uh, find out more about these fish. <laughs> so one of the things right away I just want to jump into is that um, it was like two months into it, I realized right away that something really bizarre was happening because literally like these are the gonads, these are the eggs of different females at entry. But the crazy thing is, is that all of these lamprey were harvested on the same day, often minutes apart. And there was no significant difference in size between these lamprey you'd think, oh, look at lots of big eggs here, then this must be a really large lamprey. But there was no significant difference in body size. Yet you had kind of like, you could pretend that this one over here on the left would be like a spring salmon, for instance, analogous to a spring salmon, with really small underdeveloped eggs. And then you could say, well, this one was a late fall fish, like entering, you know, trying to make an analogy. The problem was, is they weren't separated by six months of entry. They were literally running simultaneously. Some of the females, when I would cut them open, like this one on the bottom, uh, I think this was the largest egg mass of the study. It had 25 and a half grams of egg mass. They literally burst it out. And then other times I would have to spend 20 minutes, um, you know, with a scalpel excising. 
I also want to say that all of the lamprey that I harvested, uh, after I was done examining them, um, I was careful uh, to either smoke them or put them in refrigeration and they were given out to elders in the community. So none of them went to waste, they all went to elders. So um, quickly, I'm gonna run through this because I only have a few minutes, five minutes left. But what happened was is almost immediately when I started just graphing the egg mass of these fish, I immediately started seeing that I had like these two types of lamprey that were entering simultaneously. Um, and, you know, so then I traveled to Hagerman, Idaho, because I was, I was offered to work collaboratively with the Columbia River Intertribal Fisheries Commission, and they have a high throughput genetics lab, and I spent the summer up there, and I learned this new Kelex 100 um, DNA extraction method, and then this GT-seq method, and it was, it was really awesome, because we had this really cutting edge tech, tech, technology, which were, you know, going to give us some good answers. Um, and then I had a large panel of genes to look at, 308 of them specifically. So that, that was awesome. <clears throat> and what happened was ultimately is, I'm not gonna bore you with this stuff. We'll just run through it quickly because we just don't have time to go into it. But I was able to find these different groups of genes that were working together basically. And at 12 and a half grams of egg mass, there was this clear change in genotype that was occurring, like this just really obvious change right here uh, in the genotypes of these fish. And then I also found a whole nother set of genes that were working together, we call linkage group A, that um, at 625 centimeters in length, even a more distinct change in genotype, right here you can see just how dramatic it is. Um, so ultimately what happened was, is that I was able to discover not only these two new subspecies of Pacific lamprey that no one knew existed in the Klamath River, but that we also found that there was a genetic basis for it. And then I even discovered the gene locations that dictated what type of fish it would be. Um, so this was a news headlines in the Time Standard paper that talked about the discovery. Um, there's a younger version of me there with no gray hair <laughs> working. And uh, ultimately, I was really fortunate. Um, we were able to get my work published in Molecular Ecology Journal, which is a very well-known um, and respected peer-reviewed journal. Uh, and my co-authors, Andrew Kinzinger. Dr. Kinzinger is um, the, the head of the fishery biology department, Humble State. And John, Dr. Hess and Dr. Sean Naram are uh, work with Cryptfic and the ones that graciously uh, invited me to work up in their lab. Um, when I was in graduate school and we had discovered these Pacific lamprey, um, my committee felt that because I'm a Yurok tribal member and I worked on the tribal trust fish species and I you know, discovered these fish on the Klamath River, on the Yurok reservation, that we should petition to have them uh, you know, given Yurok names, which if anybody knows, that's extremely unusual, right? <laughs> There's very strict rules about scientific nomenclature of naming uh, organisms. And so um, we submitted it and actually really got almost no pushback from molecular ecology. And so um, forevermore, uh, the uh, river maturing Pacific lamprey, um, the ones that uh, come in uh, that are underdeveloped and spend an entire year in the river and don't spawn until the next year. Um, those are called Kween, which is the Yurok word for, uh, for a river lamprey. And then the ocean maturing lamprey, the ones that come in really fat and full and they're ready to spawn within weeks upon entry, um, those are forever called Tewol, T-E-W-O-L, and that is the Yurok word for ocean. Um, so pretty awesome stuff to be able to combine, you know, old technology, new technology, and discover these fish species just recently, you know, in the last few years. Um, this article was just published in 2019, right? Um, and, and here we didn't know. And one of the reasons I think that, you know, we didn't know this stuff is quite frankly, Pacific lamprey, um, they're understudied. And the main reason is, is they don't have a commercial value, right? They're not commercially important like salmonids are, right? They don't have a sporting value. 
People don't go buy fishing licenses and go, hey, let's go buy some lures and go catch some lamprey, right? It doesn't work like that. They're really only important to tribal people, right? On the West Coast of the United States, all the way up to Alaska. So that's why they're often understudied. Um, and, um, so, and there's still a lot we don't know about Pacific lamprey, a lot. And so I was asked to sit on the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Pacific Lamprey Technical Work Group. Um, and as a result of that and other people's work, I was also able to co-author another paper, which uh, I think this was also in 2019, on the marine biology of Pacific lamprey, which is something that's really misunderstood. We understand a lot more about the life history of Pacific lamprey in freshwater um, than we do in the marine environment. It's kind of like a black box. They leave the mouths of the river, you know, and then they come back, you know, years later. Um, and the other crazy thing is, is they might not even come back to the river they were born in. The majority of them do not. Um, that's what makes them hard to study. Because of that sucking disc, when they leave the mouth of a river, they actually attach to a fish and they live off of its body fluids, right? They don't kill the fish. That would be in poor form, right? You don't want to kill your host <laughs> that's giving you dinner. So they live on that. The problem is for them, though, is that let's say that they that they attach to a whale, for instance, and that whale's migrating up the coast, right? And then down the road, when that Pacific lamprey goes into reproductive mode, that whale might be 500 miles, that marine mammal um, north of here. Uh, and when they detach, there's, it's just you know not feasible for that lamprey to swim 500 miles back to its natal river, right? So they use what's called the suitable river strategy. This is just another crazy thing about them. So those little larval ones I showed you in that one video, in their stomach bile, they have a pheromone that they secrete. And that pheromone is apparently very powerful to adult lamprey. It flows all the way down a river, flows out into the ocean, and the adult lamprey smell it. And they will follow that pheromone all the way up to, that, to the location where it came from. And the thought is, you know, evolutionarily is that if the habitat is good enough to support larval lamprey, then the adults can go there and lay their eggs and it probably will support you know, their offspring as well. And it's, we call it the suitable river strategy. So unlike salmon, which literally go back within feet of where they were born and spawn and die, Pacific lamprey are almost the opposite. They just use the most suitable river that's near them because they're basically at the whim of the hosts that they attach to when, you know, when they swim up the coast. Mm. Um, this actually, uh, this table um, is from the reintroduction plan post dam removal for the Klamath River. And I just thought, just wanted to share it with you. You can see Pacific lamprey. Um, they don't know the historic level numbers, but we estimate that 98% of the Pacific lamprey have been wiped out. In the Klamath River Basin. So our populations right now, we're only about 2% of historical. So we definitely have a lot of work to do. And as you guys all know, this is one of the big reasons, dams, blue-green algae, high water temperatures, low flows. But the good news is, of course, as anybody probably knows that reads the paper, we're about to undergo the largest dam removal in human history on the Klamath River. Thank God, right? And more hurdles have been cleared. One just last week, right, where the FERC um, authorized the transfer of the ownership of the dams to the Klamath River Renewal Corporation, which was a huge hurdle. Um, so we're, we're right on the, the edge of, of dam removal, of four dams coming out on the Klamath River. And we know that from recent dam removals, like the Sandy River Dam Removal in Oregon, the Elwha Dam Removal in Washington State, and most recently the San uh, Clemente Dam removal on the Carmel River in Southern California, which is the largest dam removal in California to date, that these ecosystems will heal themselves. If you give a river back its capacity for self-renewal, it will heal itself. And my opinion is it's because you can't erase hundreds of millions of years of what these fish have been doing by just a hundred years of a dam in place. They are still carrying those recessive genes, right? And those cryptic genes, we call them, right? And they just need to have an open river again uh, with normalized flows and temperature and 
nutrient fluxes and sediment movement. And we've seen from those three dam removals I just named that with very little help from human beings, that these, these were all very successful uh, dam removal projects. All right. And with that, does anybody have any questions? Thank you so much, Keith. We'll save questions for the end after Kirk says a few um, things, but we do have some great questions that I can't wait to get to. And thank you so much for all your work discovering those new species. I would like to try some Pacific lamprey eel myself. Smoked that is, that sounds delicious. It tastes a lot like unagi when you get the smoked eel in like a Japanese restaurant. It's pretty similar to that. Inter okay, interesting. Yeah. Well, if, um, I don't know about you, but I am wondering how we can advocate for these Pacific lamprey. So tonight, myself and everyone here has the opportunity to do just that. So recently, Senator Wyden has introduced the Southwest Oregon Salmon Protection and Watershed Protection Act, which is part of the Oregon Recreation Act. And we also have another really cool bill on the table called the River Democracy Act. And if you want to hear a little bit more about these, I'm going to hand it over to Kirk real quick and he'll let you know a little bit more. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction, Allie, and awesome presentation, Keith. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here real quick. Let's see here. All right. How are we looking here? We good to go? Awesome. Well, thank you all again. Um, thank you, Ali. Thank you, Keith, for a great presentation already. I'm here tonight to, and excited to share with you about some of the protections for our beloved Oregon rivers that we have. I wanted to start by uh, thanking a couple of different organizations that have been involved with these sort of protections for years, and that's the Calmeopsis Audubon um, and the Friends of the Calmeopsis. They've worked for years on river protections in Southwest Oregon. And so um, just really fitting into the mix with them and really great advocates for our rivers down here. I'm gonna start off with just a, a couple different protections that have been currently proposed in legislation. The first one that Allie mentioned was the Southern Oregon Watershed and Salmon Protection Act or SALSPA is what its acronym is. Um, the other one would be the Oregon Recreation Enhancement Act or the ORE Act and the River Democracy Act. The current legislation will protect rivers statewide, but for the presentation tonight, I'm going to focus on the watersheds of Southwest Oregon and what makes them special and how you can help. One thing to keep in mind is that all rivers and streams in our great state, regardless of size, provide numerous benefits to our clean drinking water, communities, and fisheries downstream. This picture here is of the lower rogue below Agnes boat ramp, um, and it's currently a wild and scenic section right now. Let's start off with uh, the Southern Oregon Watershed and Salmon Protection Act. Again, uh, the acronym for that is SALSPA. Um, this legislation would provide permanent mineral withdrawal protections in Southwest Oregon. Currently, a few years back, a 20-year mineral withdrawal was, was passed for this section. Native Fish Society and those other organizations worked really hard in order to get these protections, but this would be monumental to get these permanent, um, this permanent mineral withdrawal in this area and protect it from harmful strip mining. Um, this includes the headwaters of Hunter Creek, Pistol River, Rough and Ready Creek, Bald Face Creek, North Fork Smith River, it will ensure clean drinking water for thousands downstream, and it protects struggling nadromous fish populations from harmful strip mining. Um, that would include Chinook and Steelhead. The second legislation that I wanted to share with you all tonight would be the Oregon Recreation Enhancement Act. Um, included in this act would be SALSPA, or the Southern Oregon Watershed and Salmon Protection Act. It would provide those permanent protections for those headwater streams, what I just shared with. 
Um, the other thing that's included is a rogue wilderness area. So currently when you float the wild and scenic section of the rogue um, from Graves Creek to Foster Bar, the first section is in BLM's um, federal lands. This would provide protections of a wilderness area in those uh, BLM lands. Um, this was introduced a couple of years ago um, and reintroduced just a, last month, I believe, in the Senate. It would also provide uh, a Malala, Malala National Recreation Area up in Northern Oregon. So it's another great protection um, that would be added as a benefit. This photo here is a picture of the wild and scenic section of the Rogue. It's a little bit further down in that wilderness area. But again, if you haven't been on that section, gorgeous area. I was on it for the first time this year and um, definitely deserving of some river protections. The last legislation that I wanted to share with you all tonight would be the River Democracy Act of 2021. Um, it was proposed in February of 2021, and it was the largest wild and scenic proposal ever. Uh, Senator Wyden reached out to all Oregonians and asked for their proposals on what rivers and streams in our state they would like to see get designated wild and scenic under the Wild and, rivers, wild and Scenic Rivers Act. So it was a grassroots style proposal that came in from all over, and that included 2,500 different Oregonians reaching out to Senator Wyden's office to share rivers and streams of their choice. With that, over 4,700 miles were included in this legislation. And it, the protections that are included in this would be a one mile stream buffer or riparian areas, about a half mile on either side of the river. Um, and then it would also, it protects just federal lands. So most folks don't understand that these wild and scenic rivers protections won't affect property, private property rights or anyone's private property in the area. Now I wanna transition into some of the rivers that it's gonna protect all of these legislations. And I'm gonna start off with one of our beloved rivers on the Wild Rivers Coast. Pictured here is the Pistol River. Um, Pistol River is a wild fish stronghold. Species inhabiting the Pistol River watershed include threatened coho salmon, fall chinook, winter steelhead, Pacific lamprey, western brook lamprey, Sea run cutthroat trout, resident rainbow trout. Ample opportunities for recreational fishing can be found every month of the year on the Pistol River and its tributaries. This picture here was taken by Ken Morish of Flywater Travel. Gorgeous view, um, gorgeous river. Here's another picture of Meadow Creek. It's a tributary of the Pistol River, um, way up high. It's, it's again included in the River Democracy Act. So protections for this beautiful area. Some of the biggest threats for Pistol River would be logging. Um, and again, the strip mining that was included in Salspo or the Southern Oregon Watershed and Salmon Protection Act. Next, I wanted to talk about the Upper Rogue. Um, pictured here is Union Creek, but many of the drainages of the Upper Rogue River flow from wilderness areas and through wild country, including wild roadless areas near Crater Lake National Park, the Sky Lakes Wilderness Area, and the Rogue Umpqua Divide Wilderness Area. Recreation is a boon to the local economy up there. The Rogue River area and adjacent streams see well over half a million visitors each year. Recreation includes driving for pleasure, fishing, wildlife viewing, whitewater paddling, camping, hiking, swimming, picnicking, and more. Many of the streams are located above Lost Creek Reservoir. So there's Union Creek in the South Fork of the Rogue. Um, these these uh, are, Lost Creek Reservoir is a barrier to anadromy and salmon and steelhead, but they do boast um, a good population of resident trout. As you can see, this one is up near Crater Lake and actually um, has a little bit of snow on the ground this time of year when I, this photo was taken. Next, I'm going to share a little bit about the uh, tributaries to the Illinois Wild and Scenic Illinois River. Um, United States Forest Service found Indigo Creek is one of the most important tributaries in terms of wild fish production in the Illinois River Basin. Uh, Indigo Creek, with other major tributaries of the Illinois River, are producers of anadromous salmonids that continue to feed the world famous 
Lower Rogue River fishery. Indigo Creek offers a rare opportunity for whitewater boaters that are willing to hike their boats into an experience of challenging and intimate paddle of a beautiful remote and otherwise inaccessible area. In 2004, the US Forest Service recommended that Congress add the lower part of Indigo Creek and Horse Sign Creeks to walk to the Calmeopsis Wilderness. Um, I wanna thank Northwest Rafting Company and Zach Collier. They're the folks that provided these photos for, for this. And um, yeah, just a gorgeous creek running through the Calmeopsis Wilderness. And here's a picture of those kayakers making it into their put-in. So again, another beautiful location. Lastly, I wanna share, share about Hunter Creek. Um, Hunter Creek is a wild fish stronghold. Um, it hosts runs of fall Chinook, winter steelhead, threatened coho salmon, Pacific lamprey, western brook lamprey, and sea run cutthroat. Resident cutthroat and rainbow trout find refuge in the upper reaches of Hunter Creek. Hunter Creek provides opportunities for hiking, biking, fishing, horseback riding, dispersed camping, whitewater paddling, and swimming, close to the town of Gold Beach. Other great recreational activities include bird watching, wildflower viewing, and mushroom foraging. Again, these photos came from Ken Morris. You can see how uh, some beautiful winter steelhead um, and some winter steelhead fishing as well. Um, along with this, this next photo, great shot of a uh, jumping winter steelhead in Hunter Creek. I wanted to finish my presentation tonight with some areas that which you can reach out and you can help engage with. The number one thing that you can do is thank Senators Wyden and Merkley for their leadership in protecting our rivers. Thank them for introducing the River Democracy Act of 2021. Thank them for the ORE Act. Um, thank them for SALSPA. It's important that we send this thank and support from our local areas, whether it be down here in Southwestern Oregon, or up north by Portland, multiple different areas were proposed. So it's important that we share that this is important to us with Senator Wyden. Allie and I have made this super easy for all the folks on the call tonight. Um, actually, KS Wild has an action alert already out there and it's live. Go ahead and um, click on the link that Allie's gonna throw in the chat box and you can go to their website, KS Wild's website and fill out a thank you letter to Senator Wyden and Merkley for all their great work in helping protect our Oregon rivers. The other thing that you can do is you could actually provide testimony to the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. And with that, um, I'd love to reach out and help with you. If you're interested in doing so, please reach out to Allie and I, and we can, we can work with you on some of this. It really is important that we share with them that these, these protections for our Oregon rivers are, are put through and this legislation's moved forward. Um, lastly, I just wanna share a little bit about the pictures. Um, with a great presentation from Keith tonight, um, a good friend in, with the Calmeopsis Audubon, Anne, sent me this photo in the top right. I think you guys can see my cursor. These are, this is a historic shot of lamprey crawl, crawling up or um, climbing the falls, the Illinois River Falls. Um, and then here's some just regular shots of the falls that Barbara um, from uh, Friends of the Calmeopsis uh, shared with me. So such a beautiful area. This is the wild and scenic Illinois River, um, but we definitely have plenty of rivers to be advocating for and protecting here in our great state. So it's up to us to step up and, and really reach out and ask, uh, ask our, thank our senators for, for doing these protections and really push them forward. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and, and transition us back to Allie for any questions that folks might have for the presentation tonight. And um, we'll go from there. Thanks, Kirk. Yeah, I see uh, Keith has been answering some questions live for folks in the Q&A box. So navigate over to that Q&A box and check out those questions and answers. And I do have a few others here. So uh, someone put a question in the chat box. 
Um, and they were asking Keith, when you get back up on screen. Oh, I'm here, I'm listening to okay. you. Okay, uh, someone asked, are eels consumed by orcas to any extent when they're in the ocean? That's a great question. Um, actually, I don't have an answer for you. I, I'm not sure, to be honest with you, if they would be consumed by orcas. That's a, a great yeah. question. There's a lot that we don't know about their, about their marine life history, admittedly. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, it seems like um, they're still mysterious creatures since they're not so popular, like you said, as salmon or steelhead. Um, sure. Well, you know, and with some of these anadromous fish are very cryptic in the, I mean, steelhead too, right? I mean, we, we know, you know, for a long time, everyone like, what happens to steelhead in the ocean? I mean, you know, I fish a lot. I do. I have two boats. Well, really three with my drift boat. I fish in the ocean a lot, my entire life. Maybe once my entire life, if I caught a steelhead in the ocean. And I've caught probably a couple thousand salmon in my lifetime on fishing rods in the ocean, right? So like Pacific lamprey, steelhead, you know, we, there's a lot that we don't, the ocean is just so vast, right? It sure is. It sure is. Uh, someone else asked, can you recommend a good source, like a book, an article, a podcast, or a video to learn more about traditional ecological knowledge? Oh, about traditional ecological. I thought you were going to say about eels. Can you see my <laughs> video? I can see you. Yes. Oh, okay. Because I was holding up a book. I don't know if anybody saw this. Oh, kind of. It's um, it's going into your background. Oh, the book. Oh, there we go. Eels. If you put it in front of your face, I think. Okay. This uh, is this is a cool book too. The Book of Eels. I can make sure to put that in the follow up email, Keith, so okay. folks can have that resource book on hand, and they can go. But as far it. as traditional ecological knowledge, I think you know it's becoming a lot more widespread. I think even 10 years ago, you know, you didn't hear it much, T-E-K. T-E-K now, not just with fisheries, but with cultural burning and a lot of the other areas or our condor releases that our tribe's about to do, bringing back the condor, right? Um, that's an extremely important bird to our people uh, because we feel that it, it flies so high, so large, so close to the creator. Um, so there's... There's a lot of examples of traditional ecological knowledge now also in peer reviewed studies, you know, and if you go to Google Scholar and you want to find out more, I recommend go to Google Scholar and then type in traditional ecological knowledge and see all the different papers that come up and start reviewing some of those papers. And there are some papers out there, I think, uh, um, that deal specifically um, with TEK, even on the Klamath River Basin, you know, um, there was a woman, a Dr. Norgard, Carrie Norgard, who got her PhD examining the food uh, diets of the Karuk people, the Karuk tribe, right? And um, she's got a really amazing dissertation, and that's available online. You could go read that. So, but I recommend Google Scholar, type in traditional ecological knowledge, and you'll probably be overwhelmed with like, actually how much information is out there, which is phenomenal, right? And let's just, you know, again, long answer, I know, but let me just say this, you know, we're all indigenous from somewhere. So whether your people are from Ireland or New Zealand or South Africa or wherever your people are from, right? Um, all of them had indigenous knowledge that they practice thousands of years, right, before, you know, travel, you know, uh, was uh, available and even sailing ships and stuff. And, you know, these, these people were all isolated from each other and they developed these place-based practices, right? And they even developed certain, you know, bacteria, right, in their gut to digest a certain type of food and a certain diet. And um, so, I think it's really interesting to go back and study uh, all of the foundations of, of all the different cultures throughout the globe. Um, so. Thank you, Keith. Well, we have two more questions. 
I know we're a little over time, but if folks want to stick around for two, a uh, couple more questions, that would be great. And um, Keith, thank you so much for your time. And I don't want to take any more of your time. So we'll end on these last two questions. So uh, the pheromone thing is wild, this person said. And he asked, can you talk more about that? Are there any other species that do a similar thing? You know, there are. There, I think pheromones is another, you know, widely misunderstood, understudied thing, even in human beings, right? We're just learning more and more all the time about pheromone releases and even how we get mates and stuff, right? Um, but yeah, the pheromone thing is pretty wild, right? It, and it's really minute. Um, and there's been experiments done where they've actually uh, recreated the pheromone in a lab. There's a synthetic version of it and they've tested it. And um, it, it's, it's absolutely valid. Um, it's, it's, it's very small. Again, I'm not an expert in this, but I think it's like, you know, it's like one part per 500 million or something. It's a really minute amount, right, of uh, in, in the water column. And yet the olfactory system of these adult lamprey, they're able to sense it and follow that up there. It's just, just, just crazy, right? But, um, but how awesome though, right? It's like this beacon, right? It's like, hey, you know, look, come up here, come up here. You know, there's all these larval lamprey living there. So it's probably a healthy habitat, right? Especially if they're putting out enough pheromone that can go hundreds of miles down in the river and who knows how far out in the ocean to... Uh, to make contact with the adult lamprey that, that, that they can sense um, through chemical cues or olfactory, uh, however the process is. Um, but yeah. It's, yeah, that's it's fascinating. Wild, wild and fascinating. <laughs> yes, very much so. <laughs> well, the last question, Keith, uh, for you is two parts. Do the subspecies of Pacific lamprey exist outside of the Klamath River Basin? And if so, is there documentation of where else this has occurred? I think I know the answer. So that's a great question. Uh, they may exist. These two types may exist outside the basin, but so far, um, and not by a lack of trying, they haven't been able to reproduce these results in other basins. And I know Cryptthick, uh, you know, John Hess and Sean Naram's crew has tried at Willamette Falls. They do a great number of collections in the Willamette River that, you know, are there. And um, they've tried to use the same um, SNP analysis, and they have not been able to find the same two types, which is really intriguing um, because it kind of changes the way we need to look at their migration patterns. Um, because we thought their migration patterns were much more vast than that. So it means that there may be like these, these localized populations around the Klamath River mouth uh, that don't venture very far um, and that are just endemic to, to, that, to the Klamath River. Um, but it's not by a lack of trying. And it hasn't been an exhaustive study, admittedly. There's, um, there needs to be more studies done. What I would like to see and what the, uh, Dr. Kinzinger and I would like to see is the same study that I just did. Um, we would like to see that done at the mouths of all the rivers, all the way up, you know, through Oregon and Washington, at the mouth of the Winchuck, the Chetco, the Pistol, the Rogue, the Elk, the Sixes, um, and, and, and see if we can reproduce these results. Um, it, would be, uh, it would be intriguing though, if it is specifically under the Klamath River Basin, um, I guess it wouldn't be that surprising considering that the Klamath River Basin already houses the most diverse number of lamprey, not all Pacific lampreys, some of them are resident lamprey that don't migrate to the ocean like the Miller Lake or the Klamath Similis. Um, so I, I guess I would be somewhat surprised, but not all that surprised. The Klamath River Basin keeps surprising us with its uniqueness. Um, as we know, just the other day, for instance, the state of California now recognizes Upper Klamath Spring Chinook as a separate and distinct species, right? So now we're managing for three different ESUs on the Klamath River Basin, the Southern Oregon, Northern California Coast Chinook, the Upper Klamath Trinity River Chinook, Fall Chinook, and now the um, Upper Klamath Spring Chinook. So 
I think the, the basin has even more secrets that it holds uh, as we gain more advances in genetic analysis. That's great. And I hope we see more of its magic with the dam's removal. <clears throat> Well, well you know, and these fish have an incredible life history. I mean, there's a reason they've been around for 500 million years. I didn't mention that. You know, it's hard in a short talk to give, to, to, you know, lay out all the facts. But another intriguing fact that's just a mind blower is that the fossil record, Pacific lamprey, had been found 540 million years in the fossil record. So they've been here half a billion years, right? Just like sturgeon. I mean, there's only three core dates that are, that are left. It's sturgeon, hagfish, and lamprey. Um, and these fish have been around for, you know, close to a half a billion years or more, um, sturgeon and lamprey, you know, doing this. So they clearly have a successful life history. It, it, uh, it works, you know, it's repeatable. Um, mass extinction events have happened, right? Dinosaurs are completely come and gone, and yet these lamprey persist. Um, because of their life history uh, strategies, such as maybe the pheromone and um, their metamorphosis that they go through, their ability to totally survive in a river sediment, completely like little race cars. They're like completely tuned into the river sediment, like, you know, no eyeballs, filter feeders, you know, and then suddenly they're like, hey, now I want to go to the ocean. So I'm going to grow some eyeballs. I'm going to grow the sucking disc so I can parasitize on things out there. Oh, I'm going to need a set of kidneys. You know, it's just, it's just crazy. It's, it's a just, superpower. Yeah. Could you imagine, you know, I have three children. Can you imagine if human beings did that? Oh, you know, my kid just uh, turned six the other day and he suddenly grew eyeballs and he completely grew a different style of mouth and he eats completely different. Oh, and he grew some new internal organs. I mean, you know, that's just pretty wild stuff, right? I mean. It is, it is. Right. And that's why I love the wild so much. Yeah. Well, that's great, Keith. That's really awesome. And I think that's a great place to end on. I just wanna say thank you to you both, Keith Parker, Dr. Parker, thank you so much for all your studies. And I will include your information on how um, folks can contact you in the follow-up email, because there's been some folks that would love to reach out to you, Keith. Please and do, feel free to give out my email. And awesome. I just want to clarify one thing. So I'm not Dr. Parker, I have a <laughs> master's degree. So I, I don't have a PhD and I just want to be clear about that. So okay, um, I have not got my PhD yet, but who knows, who knows. Well, thank you, Keith Parker, for all your studies that you've done <laughs> and you. um, all your uh, studies that you've gotten published in journals. So I would like to include those links in the follow-up email as well. Thank so you for having with, me. Yes, thank you so much. And with that, just stay tuned for our next Love Where You Live series coming up uh, these next couple months. We have a two-part on why serpentine rocks. So you're not going to want to miss that. Um, look for a follow-up email from Kirk and I. I think they're going to be sending one out and we'll send one out. So keep uh, a lookout for that. And with that, stay hydrated, stay cool. Do you have any last words, Kirk? Speak up for our Oregon rivers up here. So yeah. Yes, definitely. Thanks. And I'll include a link um, for y'all to take action in the follow-up email too. Awesome. Thank you all. Thanks, Allie. Thank you all. Have a good night. See you next time. Well, that went well. Yeah. Good. Awesome good. presentation. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs>